So Kamal, how are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? It's a nice, uh, it's a nice sunny day in London, so I ain't complaining. <laughs> yeah, we we cherish those, I suppose. <laughs> we do, yeah. You gotta when you get sun in September, you gotta count your blessings, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, talking about sun, this is this is a crazy segue, but. The, <laughs> kind of working work, work. about blessings because <laughs> <laughs> um, there there is a line on the album. Uh, it's kind of the uh, final track where you're so close to the eye of the sun, and then this kind of where where you grew up and where you're from. I mean, it's it's such a different thing than growing up in London. What was the what was the musical atmosphere growing up? Because was there a lot of celebration? Was there a lot of, how, how should I picture it for somebody who's never been there? So when I was growing up in the early 90s in Bahrain, it's kind of like you had a lot of your traditional music still. That was kind of all around you. I didn't appreciate it <laughs> at the time. You know, my dad would be playing all these like old Arab tapes in the car um, Kothum, Feirouz, all this traditional Bahraini stuff that I can see all around me. That was all there, but I wasn't appreciating it at that time, you know? And then other than that, there was just pop music, rap music, and metal. That okay. was kind of like, as far as it went, you know, there wasn't, oh, and probably like electronic music, actually, but like cheesy kind of fiesta kind of vibes, you know? Like the, the 90s kind of disco... Changed. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's changed a bit since then. My older brother is still out there. He's putting on young bands and stuff, kind of trying yeah. to nurture a scene there. But for the most part, a band like us didn't exist there then, and we don't really exist there now. So it's kind of, we're a bit of an anomaly, you know? Is, is that a... How how should I, I don't know if disappointing is is the is the right word, but I I don't know if you play back in uh, Bahrain, but but is that a, a sad thing for you that that the culture isn't isn't such that that a band like yours can do well over there? Yeah, it is sad. I mean, Bahrain's such a tiny place <laughs> sure. in itself, but to be kind of like uh, loved and going back there and playing all the time, we have played there, but not okay. for ages. Um, I think we're trying to plan to do something there soon. Um, but in the bigger picture of it, we never play in the Middle East or North Africa. Mm. And that to me is really depressing. It's like, I'd love to play in places like Cairo and Beirut and Palestine, but those opportunities haven't really popped up for us yet. I feel like it's hard to categorize us. We mm. don't really fit into many scenes. You know, there's some great scenes in these countries, like great punk scenes, great experimental avant-garde. It's like there's great music coming out of these places, but we still don't fit into any of them, weirdly, <laughs> um, because we are such a mixed match of so many different things, emotions, genres. It's hard to kind of be like, okay, this is a, a punk band. This is an electronic band. Throw them into that scene. It's a bit more complicated for us. Yeah. So was it almost a necessity then that you, that I don't know what, what the main reason was for, for moving to London initially, but, but in terms of music, was it a necessity to be able to express yourself musically the way you want it? Oh, completely. Yeah. So I met the other guys. We grew up together in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. So we're childhood friends. We've been making music together under various projects since we were like 15, 14. Right. So there was no real venues in Bahrain at that time. We're playing in Irish bars. I think we played in like a, we used to play a lot of gigs at this curry house called Jim, which okay. was run by this eccentric Irish guy. <laughs> Uh, we played in all sorts of weird venues, but there was no proper festivals, no proper like scenes. Um, I moved to London when I was 18 and that was the first time I went to a proper music festival and was mm -hmm. able to go and see all the bands that I've been dying to see <laughs> like my whole life, you know? 
and so it was kind of a big uh, mind blowing experience. Um, I remember one of the first festivals that we went to when we moved here was All Tomorrow's Parties, and it was curated by Matt Groening. Okay. Uh, the, the guy, Simpsons the guy, guy who made The Simpsons. Yeah. yeah. So he curated a whole festival, and um, Iggy Pop was there. The Boredoms okay. were there. Kanona Number One were there. The OCs, Deer Hunters, like all these <laughs> fucking amazing bands that that we loved and were dying to see. And it was such a kind of inspiring <laughs> moment to finally be immersed into all all of that. You know, I remember at that same festival we met Iggy Pop. He was uh he was in his limo and we were like, I think that's Iggy Pop and we were like, Iggy and he opens his limo door and he's like, Get in boys And so <laughs> okay. he was he was wearing the silk robe and there's these photos of us with Iggy Pop in his limo. Oh, that's we were there with him. We were there with him for like twenty minutes or something. Um <laughs> so yeah, I think just being thrown into all of that was a necessity like you say yeah it needed to happen because music's kind of in my bones and i needed to be around music and things that inspired me otherwise i would have just been depressed and not <laughs> fulfilled you know sure and and that's an interesting kind of uh way to think about it because how did your creativity then then kind of uh manifest itself or uh, how how did it um expand kind of in the, the way your creativity works um especially if we look we're now 10 years into the band uh i suppose so so yeah. how has that developed from, from the moment you kind of arrived in london and kind of where you are now so i think one of the few benefits of us not ha not growing up with a scene or anything is that there was no one no other bands, no other things that we'd be like, okay, that's how we have to do things. Mm. You know, we were never part of any scene. We were never part of any movement. And so we always did things our own way. So even when we started the band, we didn't use a drum kit. We didn't use a bass guitar. We barely used guitars. We just brought in all these other weird instruments <laughs> and kind of just put them all together and be like, what can we do that's interesting that doesn't really exist to us? And I think because there wasn't any other contemporary bands doing it with us when we were growing up, we could kind of operate within no rules. Mm. And slowly over time, we've added the drum kit, we've added the bass guitar, we've added all the vintage synthesizers, the sass guitars, all the weird other Middle Eastern instruments we use. They've kind of all developed. And we operate as a... <laughs> It's not normal, but as a kind of, we operate as a band now, but we still do a lot of tendencies that lots of bands, other bands don't do, such mm, as how sure. we swap around in instruments. Um, we're kind of fusing all these different things together. You can kind of hear influences from our cultural history. And there's so many different elements of the band that wouldn't make sense or be there if we had just grown up in the UK, for example. Right. Oh, definitely. And I, th I think that element of, of kind of uh, uh, band members, especially uh, in, the, in the live shows, switching positions and uh, playing different types of instruments. I, th I think that's obvious for you guys, it's fun uh, because you get to do different things. But for the audience, I always loved it when people started switching up places. And <laughs> But you, you also have to be very knowledgeable about music if you and then you have to have some skills. So, so what, is there, uh, well, for you personally, what do you prefer doing live? Uh, do you like just grabbing different instruments all the time or how, how do you see that? I mean, it definitely makes the gig very stressful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not stressful is the wrong word, but you have to really focus. Sure. You can't just get tuned into one instrument because you're always going to be swapping and you have to remember all these things. And so um, there's a lot to remember and you're kind of <laughs> moving around quite a lot. But the advantage of it, especially in the writing process, is that mm. everyone plays this instrument differently and to us we're always thinking like who can play this instrument in a way that benefits that song mm. 
And so we have the ability to be like complete, completely have a different guitar sound on every single song because we're swapping around, for example. And I think it makes it more interesting for us. And it definitely adds something to the creative process because we're not just tuning into one instrument. We're doing lots of different things, weaving in and out and kind of fully immersing ourselves into right. our own world, you know? Yeah, oh, definitely. And well, which instrument that you've tried to to master has given you the most uh, trouble? Is it one of the uh, traditional ones, or that because that, some of those instruments seem very, very tricky? Man, you know what? This is like uh, <laughs> this is kind of silly to say, but just the traditional electric guitar okay. has brought me. <laughs> and this is different for every member because Charles in the band. Charles is an incredible guitar player. Mm. He's the one doing all the solos. He can, he's a guitar virtuous. He's incredible. But I've always struggled, struggled with the guitar. <laughs> and even though I play it quite a lot on the record, I'm more comfortable playing like my Turkish Saz guitar okay. or my Tai Chi Goto or, I'm more, or using my vocals. I find that, I don't know why, I've always found the guitar really hard to play. Some people kind of master it quickly, <laughs> but for me, I find it a really hard one to get very good at, you know. Oh, fair enough. Well, if if we go to the the album then, because I I went through a, a couple of interviews um, th that you and the band did, and one of the things that that I came across was that there was after uh, Levitate, there was kind of this doubt that that another album will be. Uh, realized at some point um is that uh, is that correct and and how come i think we were so worn out when we when we put out after we put out levitation we'd been touring constantly for years and years we were both juggling three jobs at a time mm. it's like the typical musician thing you know it's a hard life until you kind of break through and Obviously, we're not a young band. We've been doing it since we were 18. We're 32 now, right. you know? So that's a lot of years that we've kind of dedicated to the band, and we love it. We're all best friends. We love what we do, but it's hard to do it when you're having to juggle all these different things and kind of struggling to pay the bills and all of that. Um, but then COVID happened, and it kind of changed our perspective a bit because we were able to slow down for a bit mm. we weren't able to work we weren't able to tour <laughs> and when lockdown happened uh because we're all neighbors and my we had my studio in the back of my garden we were the only people that we saw and so every day we would be in my studio writing head of pomegranate going hanging out in the sun doing barbecues poker nights going back into the studio And so it kind of re um, brought back the love of it all and was just like, mm. we need to do this. We have this amazing sound. Maybe it hasn't clicked with everyone. Maybe we haven't broken through with it, but we still believe there's something really special there. And I think Head of Pomegranate is the amalgamation of that, you know? And I'm so happy that we were able to do it and record it with our dream producer and yeah yeah it's amazing and then and, and i'm glad that people like uh our bands like uh yours kind of because i i get that the the music business is quite volatile and it's a tricky tricky business to navigate but it's it's so cool then that bands still still produce uh awesome albums so especially the, the, <laughs> <Yeah>. those <coughs> Especially those uh, first sessions then uh, during COVID when, when you came together and then kind of just started messing around probably. Uh, the, and, and How did the, the kind of overall sound of, of what the album would be come together? Because there, there are some, uh, as you mentioned earlier, those, those synths and then I, I think Afro uh, synth was kind of a, a, an influence as well. How did you kind of arrive at, at those very, very catchy sounds of uh, for instance tall glass is a good example it's just this very catchy kind of riff sound and and, and it's full and warm so so how did you arrive at that at, uh, at that sound i think with this record in particular i think 
in some of our past records, we were trying to like, there would either be, how do I describe this? I think this time around, when we came into the studio, we were like, look, let's not think of what anyone else expects from us. Let's not think of what radio would want us to play, what our fans want. Let's just make the exact fucking album that we want to make. Mm -hmm. Let's do the sounds that we want to do and that make us happy. And hopefully that will be infectious enough that it will kind of go further than us and other people uh, could love it too. You know, that was our attitude from the beginning. It was just like, let's take this sound that we love making and let's just create some songs and see what kind of vibe we can get out of it. And obviously lots of things happened throughout that writing process. Sure. It first started with the piece of COVID, us being in that room together, creating these amazing sounds. But then a few months down the line, my dad ends up dying from COVID. And so that's a completely different thing that affects the record, yeah. you know? And I'm having to go back to Bahrain, getting hit by this sun, physical sun and grief, and then coming back and taking all of that and putting it into the record, right. as well as everyone else's everyday experiences. It, there were lots of things influencing the record, is what I'm trying to say. Was it... Was that difficult? I, I mean, it must have been difficult, but but I can imagine the fact that you have music as a as an outlet in a way. Did did it help? Kind of dealing with the grief and the, the fact that you were in that process. Did that help? Oh, completely, completely. It's music has always been a form of therapy for me, right. for sure, a hundred percent. Anytime I'm going through shit, when I'm doing music and I'm immersed into it. I'm always, it's letting it out, you know? All my grief and stuff, that's all there on the record. It was my way of getting it all out of me. Even though it's still in me, so yeah. much of it was vented out of me and inserted into that record. Um, and that was even like a year down the line, two years after my dad died, that was still being pumped through. I remember when we recorded the album in Atlanta, mm. uh, one of the final songs on the album, Eastern Cowboys, it's a tribute to my dad. Okay. And when I did the final vocal for it in studio, it, the only people there was me, um, the producer, Ben Allen, and his assistant, Ben Ette. And I remember doing that final vocal and pushing my vocal to the extreme of where it can go. Mm. getting all that emotion out of me and I'd never done that in previous records before it felt like such a cathartic experience and when I sang that last vocal I literally dropped to my knees and burst into tears and okay. that I hadn't cried about it in like a year but that goes to show you how music can kind of bring those emotions out and there was this really sweet moment where all three of us were just kind of hugging right. and then Alan the producer was like that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen while producing an album and so I think it was my therapy yeah I think you can hear it in a lot of the songs and that grief was kind of turned into not happiness but a kind of feel of euphoricness you know mm -hmm. the album was never meant to be a sad album it's meant to be a celebration of life a celebration of my dad who was this larger than life character and so i think a lot of that seeps its way through oh that's amazing to hear and yeah that, that sounds that sounds like a beautiful moment and you can hear it in the song i, I eastern Conway is one of my favorites as well and i suppose the the the, the whole album title head of pomegranate is also kind of a, a reference to your father right the, the, because it's uh ras ruman is, is where where a lot of the um pomegranate picking was done Yes. So back in the day, it used to be a village in Bahrain that cultivated pomegranate. Uh, they don't do it anymore. Okay. But that's where my dad. That's where my dad grew up in this village, and um, he used to run a masjid, like a community mosque, out there. Mm. And we would go all the time, and everyone in the village, the whole community, would come together, share a big communal meal, 
just it was a beautiful it was a beautiful place and I think it was a fitting tribute to my dad it kind of made sense you know mm. it, it, whenever I hear those stories I wish I wish we had some of that in in our western culture where where the community comes together because these days it feels so individualistic in these big cities and in and, and, and the western world those type of stories always uh yeah so, sound so amazing um no totally I agree <laughs> Uh, another uh, song that really stuck out for me was uh, "Perfume Garden." So, so because especially because it kind of switches midway through, and you have this whole uh, ethereal kind of psychedelic thing uh, going on. Uh, what what was yeah. the idea with this song? What 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 was the? I don't want to say purpose, but what what was kind of the idea with that song? So that song has three sections, and they were kind of written throughout uh the span of covid so it's kind of linked into what i was saying before so the first half of that song is the kind of gentle when covid first happened mm -hmm. you got to slow down life which is what we needed and so we were kind of just like blissed out in my garden soaking in the sun hanging out with my cat making music it was like even though COVID was such a bad thing, that slowdown was much needed for us. And that's kind of got what's going on, that kind of blissful unawareness within the first half of it. Mm. And then the second part of the song is the bridge, where it kind of slows down, gets a bit wonky, like, we're not sure about this. <laughs> the third section is when the reality kicks in. That's when my dad ends up dying from COVID. The mm. the thing that was brought me peace in a way also mm. brought me this extreme sense of sadness and grief. Right. Um. But then you're like, I can't get swallowed by this grief. I need to grow again and I need to pick myself back up. And so the whole song is just this bit of a journey of emotions and Yeah, it's one of my favorites as well. It's the longest song on the record. I think it's the longest song we've ever put out, probably. Okay. Um, but it it fits with uh, the with the vibe that it has. If if you would have made it shorter, then then it it might have felt rushed. I think. I think so. Yeah, I think it needed to be, um, it needed to be that long. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a journey, um, and it was cool that it was written in all those different timelines. I guess. Right. Are are the lyrics something that that you predominantly um, do, or is it is it a collective thing as well? No, in terms of the lyrics, uh, it's whoever sings the song. Okay. Writes the lyrics. It's never been. That's the one thing in the band that isn't really like communal. It's always okay. kind of, um, within the singer, if you know what I mean. Uh, I tend to sing on uh the majority of the songs but charles also sings on some of the songs and we sing duets on some of them uh so charles sings lead on the dip and in tall glass mm. and then i sing the lead on the other ones and then we kind of come together and sing together in different moments such as dirty money and what are the track yeah we're always weaving in and out sam <laughs> sings back of vocals as well It's something that we love doing. No, but the, 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 I, I was gonna head towards uh, dirty money because something like that. It's it's uh, well, it's just my interpretation. But it, writing about the, kind of the the, the greed and the the, the uh, industrial military complex, I suppose. <laughs> um, but but do you then have chats uh, uh, or talks with Charles and kind of figure out how to write the song or do you just uh, stay on your own and write your own kind of bits and pieces of a, of a song like that? Um, so when it comes to stuff like duets, again, it's usually the person who writes the lyric and melody and mm -hmm. then you take it to the other band member and it's like, okay, can you think of a harmony to sing with this? And then they'll come up with the harmony and stuff. Um, but yeah, Dirty Money was just, There's a few songs on the album that are about political frustrations <laughs> and Dirty Money was kind of like a tongue in cheek way of just being disappointed about how governments profit out of war, mm. you know, 
and you're looking at countries in the Middle East that are just getting completely torn up to pieces. And it's so depressing. And I think we wanted to call that out, but do it in our kind of own surrealist way. Mm. Um, and so tracks like Gutterball and Dirty Money are our kind of way of doing that. Right. Final question then, because we kind of talked about uh, the feeling that the band needed a break for for a bit and that uh, you got there during COVID. So, so can I assume that you've kind of hit the ground running again and are, are, are operating at full force or uh, how should I see the future of, of what you guys want to do? Yeah, we're full force, baby. <laughs> we're we're in the we're in the campaign. We're about to jump into our tour of the UK in November. I think we'll we'll be coming to Europe uh next year. And so we can't wait to just share all of this. We love playing live so much. It's one of the things that we love doing the most. And our live show is this great kind of explosion of kind of you can kind of dance to it, but it's kind of truly felt as well. It's super fun. And so we can't wait to just dive back in. I think we're here for the long haul. We love it. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, the, I, th I think the, the word hypnotic came came into my mind whenever I listen to your music. You kind of dream away when whenever I put your music on. So live, <laughs> that's, that's going to be amazing. Um, May I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. No, no, thank you. A pleasure.